Well, good morning, everyone. Lovely morning. We welcome you all. We welcome also those of you who are hopefully listening to us um, on our live streaming or by recording. We hope the quality of the sound has improved. Um, we have been working on that. Another thing that we have been working on is the security in this building. We now have a new alarm system. You may notice that there are certain little gizmos in the church. The main thing is, is that nobody will be able to enter this building unless they have a special key fob. And those are going to be very limited in number. So um, anybody who has an existing key but does not have a key fob will set our alarm off. The other thing I need to say is that on Tuesday, of course, um, we have Les's mother's funeral. And some of us, I'm sure, will be wanting to go, but all of us, I hope, will be remembering Les in our prayers as he leads this um, final act for his mother. Our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 45 and is a nice uplifting message. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is God, who formed the earth and made it. He established it not to create it empty, He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I did not speak in secret, in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge, those who carry around their wooden idols and keep praying to a God who cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told you this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord, and there is no other gods beside me, a righteous God and a saviour. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, by my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. I think you'll agree some wonderful words there from the prophet Isaiah. <coughs> We're going to start this service with two wonderful hymns of praise. So we shall stand and sing, fill thou, my, fill, fill thou my life, O Lord my God, in every part with praise.
Let's pray. Living Lord, we praise you that you alone formed the heavens and the earth. That you did not create them to be empty spaces, but places to be inhabited. You are indeed the Lord, and there is no other God than you. We praise you that you spoke out loud to your creation. That you spoke out the truth and told us what is right. Living God, you have continually spoken to us humans right from the beginning. And still you speak to us. Help us hear your voice, O Lord. Guide us, Lord, in your ways. Help our erring footsteps. And when we stumble and fall, help us to rise up again as the loving Father that you are. Lord, forgive our failures when we stumble and fall into sin. Lord, clean us and fill us with your Spirit. Renew a right spirit within us so that we may be strengthened and that we may follow you in your footsteps. Lord, today as we reach out in prayer beyond our walls here, we pray for those facing danger and even death for following you. In particular, we ask, that you give the people of Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali and the DRC strength to recover from the attacks and abductions in their community. Today we join in prayer with them for you to support and strengthen their faith and utter reliance upon you. We praise you that they are standing strong and proclaiming your gospel in spite of the dangers. May they know of our love and prayers for them. Lord, as we join all our brothers and sisters in Christ, we say that prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, before we have our next hymn, we have a rather special day this week. I believe that a certain young gentleman is going to turn two this week. Oh! It's, it's joyfulness. Now, we had a debate as to whether it was Wednesday or Tuesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, right, thank you. Yes, Liz was right, of course. Why should I, why should I doubt her? <laughs> well, we have, we have some little things here for Joyful.
And I know it's not Wednesday yet, but because we won't be here on Wednesday, let us wish him happy birthday in time-honored way by singing him Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear joyfulness, happy birthday to you. It's always lovely, isn't it, when a member of our family has a birthday and we can celebrate with them. Can we take the offertory now, please? Lord, the earth is yours and you made it. And you have gifted to us so much. Accept these tokens, Lord, of our love for you. And use them for your praise and your glory. And for the proclamation of your gospel here in the community of Butt Lane. In the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. I promised that we would continue with praise, and we do. In Let all the world in every corner sing. My God. It always surprises me how short that hymn is, but it's great words, isn't it? Now Liz is going to come and give us our children's reading, followed by Alice with our main reading for the morning. This story this week is called Time to Get Up. Jesus, help me, Jesus! My daughter is dying. Jairus shouted as loud as he could, and the crowd parted to let him through. She's only 12, he explained, and she's so ill, but I know I can count on you to make her well. Please. Jesus nodded. Show me the way, he said. 
But the minute they started wading through the crowd, Jesus stopped. Somebody touched me, he whispered. Jesus, one of his friends whispered back, there are hundreds of people here. I'm sure lots of them touched you. No, said Jesus, raising his voice now. Someone here was sick, very sick. Then they touched me and God made them well. I felt it. I felt the power rush out of me. Now who was it? It was me, said a woman close by. I've been sick for so long. I've spent so much money on doctors. But when I touched your robe, I was healed. Jesus turned to the woman and smiled. He was so happy for her. You trusted me, he said. That's good. So God has made you well. <coughs> Jesus, said Jairus. Jesus, I, I don't mean to interrupt. But before Jairus could say another word, one of his servants called out across the crowd. Master, Master, I have the most awful news. Jesus, Jairus knew it even before the servant spoke. Your daughter is dead. Jesus turned from the happy woman to the sad father. It will be all right, he said. Trust me. Then they hurried off to Jairus' house. When they arrived, there was another crowd wailing and weeping in front of the house. The sad news had spread fast. Listen, everybody, said Jesus. There's no need to cry. The girl is not dead. She is only sleeping. Sad tears gave way to angry laughter. Don't be ridiculous, someone shouted. We've seen her. She's dead. Jesus ignored them all. He asked the girl's mother and father and three of his friends, Peter, James and John, to come with him. Together they walked straight to where the girl was lying. She certainly looked dead. Her eyes were closed, her face were pale, her skin was cold. But that didn't stop Jesus. He took her cold hand in his and called, Little girl, little girl, it's time to get up. Her skin grew warm, her face flushed pink, and her eyelids flickered and flew open. She was alive. And the first thing she said was, I'm hungry. Then we'd better get you something to eat, said Jesus. And it was the best meal that family ever had. Our New Testament reading this morning is taken from Acts, chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 16, Paul in Athens. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within, it, within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him into the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind 
life and breath and everything and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him yet he's actually not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as even some of your own poets have said for we are indeed his offspring being then God's offspring we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and imagination of man the times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead some mocked but others said we will hear you again about this so Paul went out from their midst but some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysus, the Aeropagit, and a woman made to Maurice, and others with them. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Thank you, Liz, and... Thank you, Alice. That was a very long reading, but I think you'll agree it was a wonderful reading. We're now going to sing a hymn to a very well-known tune. We Rest on Thee, sung to the tune of Finlandia.
That's a lovely hymn, isn't it, with some gorgeous words. Let's just pause for a moment. Lord, open our hearts to your word this morning. May we take your message to heart and dwell upon it this week as we go about our ordinary everyday lives. So Lord, speak to us in this brief moment. In the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen. Paul's second missionary journey was nothing if not but hard and arduous. He'd worked his way up from Jerusalem, crossed present-day Lebanon, through Syria, through Turkey, and uh, Turkey in those days was called Asia, by the way. All the way, he preached in the synagogues, first to the Jews and then later to the Gentiles. He'd been stoned and left for dead in Lystra, cured many of the sick. He'd parted company with, with Barnabas and John Mark after a sharp disagreement, but then carried on strengthening and encouraging the churches already planted along with his companion Silas. Then they'd been invited by a vision across the sea to Macedonia where the first recorded European Christian conversion took place in Philippi. Lydia, the seller of purple cloth, welcomed them. Paul had then met up with some people who owned a slave girl who was being exploited for her powers of divination. When Paul healed her spirit of possession, the owners saw their income lost, so Silas, so he and Silas had been thrown in jail, where an earthquake, an earthquake resulted in the conversion of the jailer because they didn't escape. Then they went on to Thessalonia where they proclaimed Jesus' death and resurrection. But as in many places, the Jews objected to this one-time Pharisee preaching about the Messiah. The Jews had them run out of town, so they moved south to Berea. But those jealous Jews followed them from, Te from Thessalonica and caused them absolute mayhem. Paul was smuggled out of town and put safely on a boat to take him to Athens, where he was to await the others to catch him up before traveling on to Corinth. Paul found himself with some downtime, and like any tourist, he did a bit of sightseeing in this wonderful great city in the first century. And there was plenty to see. Beautiful great buildings, multiple temples and shrines, idols to every god imaginable. The, the Greeks dare not leave out any god that they might have friend. To their way of thinking, if anything went wrong in life, it must be that they had offended one of their many gods. And so they went the rounds to find out which god it was that they'd fallen foul of. Being a wealthy city, they'd gone over the top with their idols and their shrines, even to the extent of having an altar to the unknown God, just in case they'd left anyone out. In fact, in first century Athens, 
there was in fact a ban on introducing any new gods or religions as they were all shrined out with too many already. Paul, of course, went to the synagogue and to the marketplaces. And as his normal habit, he discussed how Christ was the long-awaited Messiah. However, some Greeks also heard about this talk, especially about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the Greeks were the intellectuals of the first century and liked nothing better than a good debate. Also, just like the social media of today, they loved any new idea and chased after the latest theories. The thing about all their learning was that they could become deeply superficial and never have to commit themselves to any one way of thinking as a new idea would come along the next day. They were seasoned debaters, having been taught by the classical philosophers that the sole purpose of life was the pursuit of happiness. A bit like people today on social media who pursue kindness, living in the moment, mindfulness, whatever you want to call it. It's the same principle with no obligation to commit to anything, just some vague, nice sounding memes or slogans on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or TikTok. Paul was invited to speak in the Areopagus, the meeting place of intellectuals and also of the city council. Now this invitation was in fact a two-edged sword and so Paul had to prepare very carefully. On one hand he was on trial for breaking their law on introducing a new and illegal religion for which he could, if found guilty, be executed. On the other hand, the rival philosophers wanted to hear what he was babbling about. Now the word babbling in Greek actually is very disparaging. It means a man who was picking from here and there odd ideas. Which, of course, is exactly what the Greeks always did. In a way, he was dismissed before he even started talking. Now, Paul's, Paul's words recorded here by Luke is a masterclass on how to evangelize or spread the gospel. Stood in the middle of the greatest city in the region that was stuffed full of paganism and full of set views about the afterlife. He had to attempt to persuade them to transform their thinking to accept Christ and his resurrection from the dead, which was totally alien to their way of thinking. First, we notice he does not condemn their pagan way of life, but embraces their desire to seek truth, neatly encompassing both rival philosophies and their desire to find God. He starts where they are. They are very religious, he says. And then, in a masterstroke, 
He says he's not preaching a new religion, but one that they acknowledged as an unknown God. He then moves on to the idea that this one God was the only God who made heaven and earth. Casting our minds back to our call of worship from Isaiah 45, he talks about a God who does not need idols or temples as he is everywhere and created mankind from just one person. God, he says, meets all the needs of everyone and does not need our help or our duties. This short circuits all their thinking about having to serve in the various temples in one way or another. In language so reminiscent of their own philosophers, he suggests that they should start to seek God themselves. God is not far away from us, he says. In other words, he does not live on a mountain, nor does he take trips away in the pursuit of pleasure, like their gods apparently did. God never puts a notice up saying, gone for lunch back in 10 minutes. Quoting some of the actual lines from their own writers, including a Sicilian poet, he demonstrates that he knows their culture and can use it to show his message. Returning to Isaiah, he says that having God as our father and we as his children, we do not need all the idols and shrines. We would never be able to imagine what he's like anyway. The important point is that we are humble and repent before our creator God. Isaiah puts it this way, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, there is no other. Paul is attempting to change or transform their world view by stating that he is the only one God, the, the one they have to acknowledge but not named that he alone can stand in judgment at his own appointed time. And to prove the point, God has raised up this man who will be the judge of the dead. Now at this point, some of them mocked him by saying, well, that was entertaining. We'll hear you again someday. But a few actually responded. For the few, God spoke directly to them. So what are the points we can draw from this? Always start to talk about Christ on common ground. Start where people are. Even if that is discussing the latest TV program, the Eurovision Song Contest, the news or a funny dance video on TikTok, so be it. Start where people are. Never condemn their views, even if you know they're wrong. Jesus was not sent into the world to condemn the world, but that by him the world could be saved. Take an interest in their world, in their culture, in their interests. We are in the world, but not of the world, as we belong to the kingdom of God. Do not be put off by their apparent religiosity however warped it might be. 
some belief is better than apathetic no belief. There will always be those who will hide behind their apparent intellectualism. They have to prove that they are cleverer than you and try to tie you in knots. Ignore them and keep to the message. One of the problems the church has is demonstrating our relevance to a world that we know is heading to self-destruction. We have a duty to tell and show the love of the risen Christ to everyone. And we do not do this by hiding away in holy huddles, but by reaching out into our communities, being part of other people's lives, having an interest in what they're doing, celebrating their life events with them. Paul showed he knew his audience. He'd done his research, knew the local laws, knew the local culture, the current trends in thinking within the community. Only then did he start the work of introducing them to Christ who alone could transform their worldview. To the Jew, he was a Jew. To the Greek, he was a Greek. He became all things to all men to win them for Christ, to win them for the kingdom. Above all, pray constantly that our lives will reflect the gospel of Christ. We have a gospel to proclaim, a gospel that we can be fully confident has the power to transform people's lives. A message that is vital to this world. A message that can and will save lives. And we have a wonderful Saviour who will never let us down, never leave us struggling to find the words to say, as he has provided us with his own holy word. All kept entirely within the context of scripture while making it relevant to his listeners and some men joined him we will never be the ones to see the conversion of hundreds of people like the billy graham rallies rather we will plant seeds that for some will grow into a life-saving faith. As Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We as the Church of Christ on earth have the job of planting seeds, proclaiming the gospel, telling people about new lives in Christ, and being those new lives, showing the light and love of Christ. Others will build on our work. God will give the growth, because he always does. Amen. We're going to have a hymn now. It's a, a prayer. It's based on the prayer of St. Francis, who's a great favourite of mine. And it reminds us that actually it's not down to us. We need to empty ourselves to allow Christ to live through us. Make me a channel of your love.
please do sit down. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we pray for your world, the world that you created to sustain us and protect us from harmful forces. Lord, we long for your kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven. Above all, we long, Lord, for the kingdom values to be more widely accepted. The complete and utter love for you, our Lord God, and to love our neighbours as you have loved us. Lord, we pray for the many Christian organisations in the world who are putting the kingdom values into local communities through their commitment to care for their fellow people. We pray for those providing basic shelter, food and medical aid in Syria following the devastating earthquake in a land already in crisis from the war. Lord, we pray for the volunteers working in Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia and Somalia, bringing in food to the dangerous lands where attacks are common. During the, during the worst drought known, it is likely to result in the death of both animals and humans. We pray that that food and financial aid can be provided to save lives. We pray for the agricultural workers laid off without an income. May your kingdom come to mankind. Lord, we pray for the medical volunteers bringing church support to the children of Guatemala where one in five children die of medical complications of malnutrition where mothers lack the knowledge and funding to be able to feed their children. We praise you for the work of organisations like Ami San Lucas whose volunteers travel huge distances to donate food and baby equipment and knowledge. all in the name of Jesus. Lord, these are just three areas out of hundreds where your kingdom values are being brought to care for those in desperate need. And while we pray for those carers who go to so much trouble for others and at such risk, we also pray for people in this country to be inspired to help fund them. For as it is said in the letter of James, that if your brother and sister is in need, it is not enough to wish them well without providing for them. Help us, Lord, to be doers of the word not hearers only. Lord, we pray for this church here in Butt Lane and particularly for our minister, Les, as his ministry expands to cover more churches. We also pray for Les as he conducts the funeral for his mother this week. Lord, may we, as churches, continue to proclaim your gospel in this community 
and beyond. May your voice be heard through our lives. May people see the risen Christ in each and every one of us. And Lord, for those who mourn, may they know the comfort of your presence very close to them. This and all these prayers we ask in and through the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. We started with praise and we're going to end with praise because it's a wonderful thing to do especially on a lovely day like this. Oh for a thousand tongues to sing.
I obviously can't count. <laughs> now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time now and forevermore. Amen.